Thank you everybody for coming. Today we have Dr. Oliver Hartley, very special alumni um, guest today to speak to you about commercial solar. Um, I think probably many of you know Oliver already. Um, if you don't, Oliver is currently managing director of EFO, which is um, a newly set up company by Oliver for commercial solar systems in Australia. Oliver was previously uh, the managing director of QCells Australia and also formerly at QCells and Calixo in Germany. And also Oliver is a, of course, UNSW PV alumni. So please welcome Oliver. Thank you very much, Linda. And uh, I'm pleased to see so many faces here today. So commercial solar at least gets some interest. That's great. So what I want to do over the next uh, 45 minutes or so uh, is give you a bit of a view on commercial solar in Australia. And um, when Linda sent out the invitation, she actually forgot one important thing on her little invitation. And that is actually that question mark here at the end. I don't know why she dropped that, but that's actually quite important. Um, the reason is, and I'll show you that later, how the Australian market has developed. Um, but commercial solar is a lot talked about, but as a matter of fact, uh, not that much has happened yet in, the, in that segment. And uh, we'll have to see how much will happen over the next few years. I personally obviously have a bias towards commercial solar. I believe in the market, but it's actually much trickier than most people assume it is. So let me go what I, through what I want to, what question I want to answer in this little seminar. So if you have any questions during the presentation, just air them or we collect them at the end. Uh, we just see how it goes. The group is small enough to do that. So I quickly want to tell you who IFO is on one slide. Um, then I'm going to go back what has happened over the last few years in the solar industry. And that's quite important actually to then look forward what the issues are. Um, then does commercial solar actually make sense? Um, is there a fundamental need we fulfill delivering commercial solar? Um, and then this question, well, why is it, if it makes sense, why is it taking off so slowly? Uh, what's, what's, what are the roadblocks? Um, then do I get what was promised is a lot down to commercial solar is really an investment in a long-term asset where long-term returns are expected from your clients and, and from the investors. And do the investors actually get what they were promised? And we'll look into that, how we monitor it, what you can forecast, what the uh, risks are around that, and how you mitigate these risks. And we we'll just a short summary. Oh, sorry, that's a uh, wrong computer. OK, just very quickly on EFO. So EFO is about credibility with a capital C. Huh? A lot of times I, I hear, ah, oh, it doesn't matter what you know, it is who you know. And this might be right, but in, when it comes to commercial solar, I really beg to differ. You actually need to know what you're talking about and how to deliver the systems. Otherwise, you have a system that might last for only for a couple of years, and then you have, uh, but not for the 25 years. So I do think commercial solar differs quite significantly from residential solar, which I will explain a little bit later, uh, why it differs and that you actually need to know what you're doing. So IFO is a company full of solar geeks. Uh, we all have decades of solar experience. And we develop, engineer, procure, construct, commission, operate, and uh, maintain commercial solar and only commercial solar systems. So it's all about connecting Australian businesses to the sun and, and offsetting some of their uh, electricity needs by photovoltaics and, and solar electricity. I understand I'm here at the uni, and I, um, so I'm only going to spend a couple of seconds on this because I do understand it's a public lecture. I'm not quite sure if everybody's completely across solar. So just very, very briefly, obviously, we get our photons from the sun. Um, they hit our solar panels. The solar panels convert the photons into DC electricity, direct current electricity, which then gets converted into AC, and then that electricity is either used on the premises uh, in their appliances or loads or it gets exported to the grid. At this stage when we propose commercial solar it's very very rarely about off-grid or isolating a, a, a business from the grid. It's always just substituting 
the need of drawing electricity from the grid. You know? So that's what commercial solar is, is about for us. Here's a bit the hockey stick of the Australian PV market. I think you've seen it many times before. <laughs> it was basically flat at zero uh, for, for decades. And then in 2009, 10, the first uh, government program starts. And then it, it, it went up with the feeding tariffs and other mechanisms like the renewable energy target and the different schemes we have there. It looks like a brilliant, smooth, relatively smooth hockey stick. And all in all, um, at the moment, we have 3.2 gigawatts of solar installed in Australia, which actually puts Australia at, I think, number eight or nine in the, in the world. So it's really punching above its weight, which is great. From this um, slide, you think it was all plain sailing. Well, it wasn't. This shows you now a month-by-month -month data of what kind of PV was installed over the last few years. And you see these, apps, uh, um, these massive ups and downs, what a lot of people call the solar coaster. Huh? So it, it grew steadily. Then there was, uh, in 2011, this mad rush with the end of the gross feeding tariff in New South Wales. That was then stopped, and bang, it went down. Uh, it sort of went sideways for a little while. Then the multipliers came up. STCs, the small technology scales, multipliers from five down to three, and so on and so forth. So the policies behind renewable energy plays a massive role in, 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 in photovoltaics and in the industry in Australia. And that means that the industry really never, never gets boring. It's, it's not for the faint-hearted. You have to be quite stress-resistant when you're in solar industry, just to warn you on that matter. But nevertheless, the industry is still going strong. The, the, the gray line shows you what is actually uh, installed at the moment. The, the blue line is the SDCs. They always lag a little bit behind. So you see that after a few months, everything that is installed is, uh, is also registered. So at the moment, you know, we're ticking over at about two, two megawatts per month, which isn't, which isn't bad at all. So where do these two megawatts go? Australia is the country of small systems. It differs massively from most other markets in the world. Overall, um, worldwide, about over 50%, actually 55% was published last month, go into utility scale solar. So um, big solar, ground mounted solar power plants. In Australia, that's very, very different. Australia is the residential market. And you see here the system size. This is the average system size for February and August, February, August, going backwards in time. And the average system size went in 2010 from around, uh, well, about one, not, not quite 1.5. It grew, it tripled to 4.5 kilowatts. Massive, very small compared to everybody else in the world. Huh? This shows you that it's completely dominated by the residential market. And it shows you how the number of system and kilowatts did uh, develop, but it shows you as well with this ratio that the spread here goes up a bit further. But nevertheless, even at the moment, it is relatively small systems. So what's going to happen in the future now? I, I borrowed it, uh, this graph from Nigel Morage, Morris, uh, who runs Solar Business Services. And this is a forecast he published uh, last year um, in his medium scenario. Let me quickly explain what we see here. Residential grid connected distributed. So the small, the main market of Australia. Despite the fact that it actually decreased between 2012 and 2013, it's sort of going sideways and then slightly recovering again. Then there are two other segments. The grid connected distributed from 10 to 30 kilowatts and 30 to 100 kilowatts. This is the commercial solar market which I'm talking about. So funnily enough, Nigel predicts not that much of a growth. It has changed a little bit uh, over the last six months. I think uh, Nigel would agree that these numbers are now higher. But nevertheless, it's not all of a sudden a hockey stick or an explosion that's going to happen. And then we have this segment, which is the grid connect centralized solar farms, which is basically um, the farms that First Solar puts up and, and uh, Fotovagio in, in, in Canberra and these kind of power plants, they are very much driven 
by government incentives and, and uh, like the solar flagship program. So whatever happens up here is a big, big question mark because it heavily relies on the policies behind these different drivers. So that's the forecast of the, of the all, um, uh, across the entire market. So what happens more on that distributed energy? And that's a, a graph that gives you a bit of an idea what is now one of the most recent forecasts published in the um, Climate Spectator. Uh, in April. So you see the green bars is the residential system. Huh? And it's a bit, it's, it mirrors what I showed in that graph earlier. It's still doing reasonably well, going sideways. And that blue area is the commercial. It is growing, but it's not really a hockey stick that goes, uh, uh, increases rapidly. Now, now the last slide, don't go on the details. But these are the actual numbers of 10 to 30 kilowatt systems in 2011, 12, and 13 in the different states. And you see there was still a bit of a feed-in tariff happening here. It then came back down, and then you see a steady upwards trend. And at the moment, 2014, that's clearly continuing. And the same on the 30 to 100 kilowatt system. Not much happening in the 2011, but then 2012 and 13 certainly an increase, a steady increase. And that's actually what excites me about the commercial market. There is, and I will show you that later, there is a fundamental need and a fundamental business case. It makes economic sense. And whenever you have that, whatever happens on a political landscape, it doesn't really matter that much anymore because you have a substantial, uh, uh, you have a, a fundamental business case that stacks up. Okay. Let's now move from some of the forecasts and graphs and, and estimates away and go more into the detail of commercial solar. What, why commercial solar makes sense is actually so shown quite nicely here on a graph from Energex. This is the load profile at an industrial substation. It shows the demand over 24 hours. So this is down here, it's from midnight to midnight. And you see that around sort of in the early morning hours, six, seven o'clock, the demand goes up and goes up and down a bit. And then late afternoon, it tails off and goes back and then comes up again. And this is the profile that solar generates. So it matches really nicely with um, commercial solar. This is quite different to residential. That's why residential, all of a sudden, when there are no feed-in tariffs, no grows and net feed-in tariffs, it becomes more, much more difficult during the day most people are not at home. They're at work or they're at uni or uh, they're at school. And uh, that's where people don't use electricity at home. Um, whilst the commercial businesses is exactly the time of the day when electricity is used. So fundamentally, commercial solar makes sense. Now, there are these obstacles. Huh? It's, it is, uh, commercial solar is uh, an investment decision, so there are lots of stakeholders that need to play ball. There is um, sometimes a board, a company board, there is an accountant, a CFO, there is a, a facility manager that needs to come on board, there is uh, the general operations manager that needs to play ball, and everything needs to come together to actually make the case work. And there are three things, three main factors that need to be balanced. One is your roof. If you don't have a roof in your business, or your roof is completely full with other stuff, it just doesn't work for solar. You need a roof area, unless you have an um, area at the back where you can do a ground mount system, but mainly it's going to be on roof. So that's the first thing that needs to work. Second thing is your power usage. If you are a restaurant and you only open at night, commercial solar just wouldn't work for you. Huh? That's, that's just one of these fundamentals. And that's what I, why I said earlier, at the moment we're really only talking about commercial solar to substitute electricity need from the grid. If you then talk about storage and other things, obviously everything changes. However, if you look at the economics, very clearly, as soon as you package storage and battery storage or other things into it, the economics don't stack up anymore at this point in time. It will over the next few years, but today, if you only look at the eco economics, it's only solar that substitutes your need from the grid that matters. So your power usage is very, very important. And then timeline. So when we talk to clients, it's very important. What do they want to do with their business going forward? If they say, I want to sell my business next year or shut down, 
it's a very short conversation about solar, we might move on to the next topic. So timeline is a, a third one that needs to make, to, uh, to make sense. Okay, let me just quickly run you through some stuff. So this is an example um, how it, it works in, in, in real life. This is a Catholic, big Catholic high school out in Orange. Lots of roofs there, so we went through an iterative process to find the best roof. So at the beginning, it's really just a matter of, of marking some of the uh, roofs that would be suitable for solar, or potentially suitable for solar. And then we jump from there into the detailed layout where we do the proper um, proper design and in some cases when we then have the structure engineers coming in and, and, and verify that the building or the roof is actually uh, uh, suitable for solar it might turn out that this wonderful north facing roof is not suitable because it was a little bit er uh, built earlier maybe in the 60s and the, the roof structure is just not strong enough to uh, carry the additional weight. So we had to rule that out and went back to the drawing board and readjust it and, and try to, to measure that. Another thing which um, actually what I put up here is, is, is one that we come across a lot at the moment here in, in Australia when we do commercial solar. There are hundreds and hundreds of solar companies in Australia, ranging from very small ones, from really literally just uh, a man and his ute, all the way up to big companies with hundreds of employees. Normally, a residential system is installed by the guy, takes his six panels in the morning, drives to uh, the residential home, gets out, climbs on the roof, puts the six panels on the roof, and he walks off, and the job is done in two or three hours. Uh, no real design requirement. Very rarely is there a site visit up front. You know, it doesn't really matter that much. On commercial solar, however, the world changes, particularly it varies a bit from state to state, but let's say in New South Wales, when you go over 10 kilowatts, you all of a sudden need to have a compliant development certificate. So you need to actually, it's, it's, it's not quite a development approval, but you need to go through council to get these certificates. You have to talk to the grid providers and so on and so forth. There are a lot of little things. None of it itself is difficult, but because there are so many hurdles, a lot of the existing companies just struggle to deliver on their promises with regard to commercial solar. That's the second thing. So the roof needs to be right and after a couple of iterations you probably have the structure that you want to have on the roof. The second thing is that power usage. And there again, um, you think your subject you study might be difficult. Some of these power bills at least match that. Um, they are simple power bills up here where you basically have only one fixed rate, in this case it's 36 cents per kilowatt hour, and you have a fixed daily charge. That's all that matters for your bill. If you then go to larger consumers of electricity, that changes dramatically. It's actually a real science to understand what's happening on these different bills. There are about a dozen or so different charges. Some of them are charged against cents per kilowatt hour, so the actual usage, some demand charges, some are daily charges, some are uh, other fixed charges. So you have to plow through here and actually find out what your solar system would actually substitute. Obviously a solar system doesn't substitute a daily fixed charge. That will be there whether you use solar or not, right? because you're still relying on the grid. So it's, it's quite a lot of work to sift through these, this kind of information. So once you have understood your electricity bill, and you're basically trying to extract the value of your solar, the next thing what you need to do is basically understand the consumption of your particular client. What is the commercial business actually using? And what, what we do uh, with a lot of these, in these circumstances is, we get half an hourly data. So we analyze 17,520 data points over 12 months period. When you're a larger consumer, you basically get that data from your um, uh, retailer, um, and they then pass it on to us, and we do a lot of number crunching. That's one part of, of the equation. The other part of the equation is then, what is the solar system actually, what would uh, what is this, uh, the, the generation profile of your solar system? And there we basically run a simulation where we actually also throw in random weather data. So we say, okay, we have a rainy day, we have a good sunshine day, 
um, because it can happen that you have a great sunshine uh, a day or a day with sunshine on a Saturday or Sunday, but the business doesn't use any electricity on, on Saturdays and Sundays. And obviously you have to take that into your consideration when you evaluate um, the benefit of what, is, what solar is creating. I've chosen this example here because it's quite a striking one because it's the school again. Obviously during Mondays to Fridays, the school, you know, their usage goes up in the morning when the teachers and students come in during the day, they have this red profile and then in the afternoon it goes down and goes to in sort of an overnight mode. The solar system on this particular day, on the 6th of February 2013, would have produced this amount of electricity. It was a very nice sunny day and this is what we would have offset. So the new profile of the school would have been this little blue line. The yellow area is the savings that the solar system would have generated and that's the value the, solar, the commercial solar system have. On a weekend, you have that sunny day, but obviously the school hardly uses any electricity and most of it is fed into the grid. Now the problem is, um, with most of the electricity that is fed into the grid, you get zero cents per kilowatt hour just the way it is. You might be able to negotiate something with your retailer, but it really depends very much on your buying power and your retailer. Um, so we go through that, and I think that's how it should be done, day by day, and extract how much would we really save the school uh, or the client. And in this particular case, we, would have, we will save the school about 30% of their electricity, and the school actually saves $30,000 per annum they pay back the system about five years. So it's a very, very good case. And because it's a Catholic school, they have the money as well to invest directly. <laughs> All right. So this is actually now a system, straight line. Uh, I'm not running an econ economics course here, so it's really very simple. Um, your initial investment, and then you have your annual savings, which obviously create the benefit. And after four or five years, you have your money back which you initially invested and thereafter it's all plain sailing. Oh, you still have then 20 years of free electricity. And that is quite actually an interesting um, concept because you're probably aware that, that in economics um, normally when you have a supply and demand the price that a good should uh, uh, um, go to is actually the marginal cost of producing an extra unit of that product or that good. Obviously here, it's a kilowatt hour. That's the, the benefit, that's the good that's produced here. And solar can produce that extra unit at zero cost. You know, the sun comes up, the, so this system, once it's paid off, produces uh, electricity. So whatever happens, whatever happens on the electricity market, whatever happens around in the world, solar by definition is the cheapest way of producing electricity because it's at zero cents per kilowatt hour. So the long-term hedging position for a, a client is extremely strong when he's got the solar system on his roof. Now, okay, this is all sort of hypothetical. Yep, solar meets, I have a roof. It meets my uh, usage, uh, or my usage pattern matches quite nicely with the generation pattern of the solar system. And um, I basically can, I'm willing to do it. My timeline is long enough to actually contemplate to have a solar system. How do I now go about it? How do I finance it? Shall I take my own money? Do I go to the bank? What are the options? So there are three fundamental options to approach this issue. The first one is, you have the money, like the Catholic school. They have the money, they wanted to invest it, and for them it was then basically important what would they save per annum and what is the return on investment they're getting. So that's on the left-hand side. Um, you can secure quite attractive returns. I mean, we talk about, you know, we're talking about 20% IRRs and stuff like that. You own the system, you have the full depreciation, and it's a relatively simple and straightforward value preposition. Drawback is obviously you have to put the capital on the table right away, and you're fully responsible for the system. The second one is, is a leasing option. There are many, many um, off-the-shelf leasing products available these days for commercial solar. Um, from small boutique um, leasing brokerage companies all the way to the big banks. 
And uh, the benefit is you don't have an initial investment. The other benefit is pretty simple. You know exactly what you're spending every month that is in your le leasing agreement. The drawback is um, you have to pay for your lease, leasing right, no matter what. Whether the system performs or not, you just have to pay for it. You signed up and you have to pay. And obviously, a particular if you go to uh, and get one of these off-the-shelf type of products, the rates are relatively high. We're, talk about, we're talking about 10 to 12 percent uh, interest rates you know, for these leasing things. So um, when we work with clients, we often talk to them and, and see whether the, the, their local bank can help them um, to get better rates. And the third one that is currently not really available on mass scale, it's just sort of happening, is a power purchase agreement. Th that is in the essence that the client is not interested in the solar system at all. He's only interested in reducing in his power bill by using cheaper electricity, and the cheaper electricity happens to be produced by the solar system. So in that sense, the solar system is not owned by the tenant or the owner of the building. It's owned by a third party, by investors or uh, other or the banks. And then we only sell the electricity to the user of the building. Um, it uh, doesn't require any ownership by the, by the owner, building of the owner, um, owner of the building or the tenant. It's the purchase, you only pay for the kilowatt hours you actually get from the solar system and you basically have no performance risk. The drawback is you obviously don't get the return on investment on the solar system and um, uh, you basically don't get that free electricity anymore after the certain period of time because you keep on paying for the electricity and it's more complex and that's actually quite an issue um, because I showed you earlier at the moment the systems are all relatively small we're talking about 50 to 100 kilowatt systems if you then have setup costs legal costs or a third party investment cost and stuff like that that very often pushes the rates that the customer needs to pay for a sensible PPA above the level they're actually willing to pay. And um, it also means that if a company wants to sell electricity, um, generally they either have to have a retail license or they need to be exempt from a retail license. And that's a process where you have to apply with the Australian Energy Regulator and you have to jump through a few hoops to get this. Let me go a little bit deeper into the second one, the leasing. This is a very busy slide and I don't want you to try to read any of the numbers. I just want you to understand the concept because I think that is really quite interesting and it, it, I think it will change the industry quite remarkably. What's happening here is basically that the solar system is financed by an operating lease. So just quickly, if, if, if you're not aware of the concept, normally when you go to the bank and you borrow money or you have a finance lease, you're the owner of the system and you just pay your rates Yes, the bank or the financing companies might keep the uh, right to the system, but in essence, it's about you getting the ownership of the system. Um, uh, then the system is yours and you depreciate it over the 20 years period and you pay back your principal and your interests. With an operating lease, it's very different. You don't own the system. The operating lease is a pure expense, so it's fully tax deductible, which is a huge benefit for commercial businesses. Normally when you then have your operating lease and uh, you let that run over five years and you have a minimal balloon payment at the end, this means you pay maybe one more month and then it becomes you. So from your uh, expense line and your p &L, it goes to your uh, balance sheet. Um, the attractive thing is the following. You see that here. The first sort of five years during your operating lease, you're basically running a black zero, which means that whatever you're paying for your operating lease is offset by your savings from your electricity bill. And in some cases, particularly for sort of small to medium sized businesses, it actually means that they're saving money from day one. So their savings on the electricity bill is bigger than what they have to pay for the, uh, for the operating lease, which down here at the end uh, of the further five years, you know, this particular client would have saved $300 in the first year. It's not much. However, after five years, he basically owns the system without paying an additional dollar 
and then he gets the full benefit and it goes and increases in this particular in this particular circumstance this client would save about ten thousand dollars per annum all right now this is I try to explain you know what are the factors you have to balance the roof the timeline your power uh, usage these three factors I explained that from an economic point of view it makes a lot of sense uh, to do solar. Now let's look a little bit why it's not happening and what are the roadblocks on commercial solar. Taking one step back, commercial solar, very easy, you have your panels up here, you obviously, as I said, the inverter, and you either use it inside the building or it goes to, to the grid. So there are three component, uh, three things that need to come together. You need to have good components, otherwise you won't enjoy any benefits for the benefits for the 25 years. You need good in engineering and you need a good installation. And all three come together like a puzzle. All of a sudden, you have really have sy high system yields for 25 years. Solar can be very, very reliable. Oops. Sorry. So, what is wrong? This is what we see quite a bit. Huh? Because the mentality at the moment of the solar market is very much in line with residential, and yes, I uh, give you a, 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 solar, a residential solar system and I also put in a bottle of wine or something like that. This was the race we've seen over the last couple of years, the race to the bottom of, of solar. And there are a lot of solar companies that actually grew to really big companies of hundreds of employees. Next day, they were gone. Oh, for whatever reason, they, there was another one who undercut them, another one was cheaper, and the whole business model just fell apart, and they had to shut shop, and there were big insolvency cases with a lot of millions and millions of dollars lo lo uh, lost. So this is something, this is actually, luckily, not happening that much in commercial solar yet, and I hope it won't happen, because I explained earlier, commercial solar has just some challenges that a lot of the resident which uh, a lot of the residential companies just can't really make it work and this is s s this stuff which i'm talking about you know there is quite a lot of engineering work required now this is a 100 kilowatt system on a on a new h care facility a, a big one you know where we had to deal with a lot of um hvac stuff on the roofs with fire escapes stuff and, and, and so on and so forth and we had to make it all fit nicely onto the roof space. We obviously then have all that different roof areas and we do a detailed shading analysis. Obviously if you have a larger system you really need to be able to do the full single line diagram. You need to be able to talk on eye to eye level with the network provider to actually get the grid connection done and you need to do a full loss analysis to know well, well this is what the sun shines that's the sunshine hours you get onto your roof what do you actually get out at the end of the day after you subtracted all the uh, soiling losses shading losses uh, uh, you know general resistance in your cables and so on and so forth so there's quite a bit of work involved and if if you want to go further and I want to see if this works you can actually go to some <laughs> very extreme levels in this in this uh, circumstances, this is a building in, in North Sydney which has two massive billboards. And when we looked at it, we thought, oh, why are we trying to, to actually put a solar system on there? You know, it's, it's really shaded. So we thought, okay, well, let's not just uh, let our, our guts decide this. Let's do the full analysis so we can... There is supposed to be an ayah, a movie where we really analyzed the path of the sun, summer and winter, where we exactly look at the shading during the day. In the summer, hardly any shading, and in the winter, when it obviously comes in much lower, um, we have more shading. And all this plays into extracting the value of the solar system to make the economic case for the client. So he's got all that at the moment. And this, we think the system still makes sense, so we are waiting whether the client wants to go ahead or not. Now, the other thing is uh, what I said earlier, 
Um, it is quite a lot of engineering work, and uh, uh, just this level of detail you have to be to watch out for. The sec part is really the installation. This is how typically residential systems get installed, and already this is a good installation because at least the conduits are marked. But um, in reality, if you think about the commercial systems where the investment can be 100,000, 200,000 or even more, do you really trust that this permanent marker is permanently on there for 25 years? I would doubt it. Right? So what we think and in, in, in how some companies work with quality assurance programs and something like that, that you basically have proper, like in any other commercial electrical uh, industry, that we do this properly. But believe it or not, it is quite a step up for the industry. Our Australian solar industry is completely geared towards the res residential market, and it will be a general development which we have to live through in Australia. The other thing is um, on the monitoring side. Huh? Less than 1% of solar systems are monitored in Australia. And that's quite remarkable considering the system is supposed to last for 25 years. My bet, and, and I think a lot of people would agree with me, we'll see a lot of solar, we have a lot of solar systems in Australia that actually be perform below what they should do. For whatever reasons, whether it's component or insulations or tree or soiling, it doesn't matter what it is, but people don't really check how well their system is performing. Um, this is obviously very different at commercial solar because you are actually selling return on investments and a value preposition. So you can go in a lot of detail on forecasting commercial solar. And one big factor you have to take into consideration is obviously the sunshine. And uh, it is fluctuating quite remarkably. And this is uh, Sydney. And you see the average sunshine data here from 2009, uh, sorry, from 1990 all the way to 2013, and you see the long-term average. So the long-term average is what goes into, you, into your financial modeling, but you see in reality it can fluctuate quite significantly from year to year. And if you have that honest discussion with your client and, and show them that this is what can happen, do you manage the expectation quite differently than when you just take the long-term average and say, ah, oh, no, it will be all right, mate. It, it might not be all right. It might fluctuate. fluctuate. And um, obviously that's on the annual basis, but we have this massive fluctuation from day to day. So this is a system um, uh, in orange, and there's a, a real-life data. Perfect solar day. You know, this is just beautiful. But in between, we have these rainy days, so all this needs to be considered when you monitor and analyze the performance of your system. Now, what you can then do is if you go through and put forward the economic case to your client, you basically then also need to discuss with them, well, what can happen? What are the variances around this expected rate of return? And here you can do, if you're a bit more sophisticated and want to have this more honest discussion with your client, you can actually go into statistics and do probability analysis. What I showed you earlier was the annual sunshine in Sydney. This is basically this peak of this distribution curve here. In average, we have about sort of 1,680 or 90, something like that, kilowatt hours per square meter of sunshine. And obviously, we assume that it's normally distributed. It's not quite correct, but this is an assumption we make which is just to simplify the stuff. And it's just too long ago that I learned statistics, so I, I take that simplification. You obviously see then the cumulative distribution, and obviously at some stage you, you go towards one because the sun has to come up. What you can then do is basically do this P90, P95, at, and P99 analysis. And I don't know, for you, who work in wind, it's a very con clear concept there. It's basically the probability that you have of 90% of that you have a value that is greater than that P90 value. And um, in wind, that's a standard practice. In solar, it's not yet. But obviously, you can do it. No reason why you can't do it. So what you see here is basically 
these values of the P90, P95, and P99. So if you wanted to talk to your client, you want to say with a probability of 95%, uh, you will get that return per annum, you basically have to take your P95 value for your commercial analysis. In this case, in Sydney, we have 1684 as um, the average value of sunshine. For a P95 analysis, you can take this 1563, and you are basically 7% below the long-term average. Huh? So with 95% probability, will your customer get the a return in this particular year if you take this value as an input variable for your sunshine data? And through this, you can basically build a lot of credibility and trust with your client that particularly when the accountants come in and, 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 and auditors and others who will basically try to challenge you on, on, on your um, value proposition for your client, you can basically argue and say, okay, we have gone through this variance analysis. This is the case for solar. This is the likelihood you will get 15, 20 or whatever percent return in any given year. All right, let's now look a bit on the actual output of some systems with this fluctuation. So you see here a system in Mount Isa, 154 kilowatts uh, installed there in, in 2000, end of 2010. In Mount Isa, you see this yellow bar. This is the long-term sunshine average, yeah? so much higher than in Sydney, but that's the long-term average. This value should give you an average output of the system of around 1,772 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak. Uh, so this is this value. Now in 2011, we had a little bit less sunshine. This is what the system then should have produced with this lesser sunshine. And this is what the system actually produced. So pretty much spot on, 1724 was actually produced versus 1671. And in 2012, we had a bit more sunshine. Um, again, this violet little bar here was, is what the system should have produced using this actual value. And this is what the, produce, what the system produced in real life. So solar is extremely predictable. You can really forecast. If you do the analysis, if you get the right data, you can really say what the system is going to produce over the coming years. All right. That already brings me to the summary on this uh, overview on the issues of commercial solar. So what I find most exciting is really this fundamental match between the generation profile of solar systems and the consumption profile, profile of, Australia, of, of businesses in Australia. And uh, if you structure it properly on the financing side, it can be a value proposition that is cash flow positive from day one. So the client doesn't have to invest an additional dollar. He obviously has to commit to it, but he doesn't have to um, invest an additional dollar to actually get the benefit of solar. Um, I also hopefully could explain a couple of the pitfalls that are out there, because for that whole value proposition, the underlying assumption is that your solar system produces electricity for 25 years. If you don't, re if you don't re use good components, if you don't engineer properly, if you don't install it properly, you're just not going to get the benefit uh, of your 25 years of, of free electricity. And, uh, but if you do it right, it is really highly predictable and reliable. And I think this is now what we're going to see over the next few years, that kind of change in the industry. And all of a sudden, I hopefully think that this commercial segment will be one of the largest segments in Australia, and not just this little bar which I showed you at the beginning, which a lot of the forecasters say at the moment. And uh, yeah, that's it for me on commercial solar. I hope it gave you a bit of an idea. And if you have questions, just fire them at me. Thank you. I'll be back. At the moment, you can deem STCs up to 100 kilowatts, um, and that may well change in short order down to 10 kilowatts or even zero. Uh, what would that do to the, the commercial proposition, and what would that effect would that have on the industry? So I'm just going to repeat the question so I, I, we can capture it on, on the mic. Um, so the question is about the possible change of the division between STCs and LGCs. So at the moment, up to 100 kilowatts. 
uh, even a commercial solar business, a co commercial solar system is eligible to STCs. The benefits of these STCs, these small technology certificates, these renewable energy certificates, is, is, is worth about 30% uh, of the initial investment value. So it's quite significant. If now by the middle of the year, or probably later this year, second half of the year, that gets reduced, that 100 uh, kilowatt threshold gets reduced to 10 kilowatt, it has a significant effect on commercial solar, no doubt about it. Because what's happening then is all of a sudden you're still eligible to, uh, uh, to LGCs, but LGCs are paid out over time, so time value of money becomes much more complicated. Um, it makes it harder. It will make a lot of company disappear because it means that they get squeezed into the residential area where it's still relatively simple, but we have hundreds of companies trying to fight for survival. So we will have more solar companies go out of business very quickly. That's, that's clear. I still think the solar case for commercial is, is, is quite good. And what I expect is that we will see financial products that actually take the stretched out value of LGCs and combine them as a value up front, which obviously won't be 30% anymore, but it could be maybe still 15% or something like that. Huh? Um, and this is a discussion which I'm having with some of the energy traders, or not energy, sorry, um, rec traders at the moment, because they are most suitable to come up with these kind of products. There is no solution at the moment. I think we're all still keeping our fingers crossed that uh, that change won't happen. <laughs> um, but you're absolutely right, it will have a big effect. Richard. Uh, Oliver, uh, thanks very much for a really interesting talk. Are there solutions for people who don't own their buildings? Um, present particular problems? Yes, um, so if you don't own your building, if you're a tenant, um, it, solar, commercial solar still works for you. Um, there, there are two factors that need to, to, to come into play. One is that you're a long-term tenant. It's very clear that you need to have a long-term interest in that, in that building and that you want to reduce your electricity cost. So if, if you have a lease of five years or even longer, then all you need is basically that the uh, building owner comes to the party. Um, the building owner needs to um, be in that overall play because it's his roof. He actually needs to sign documents to allow that the system can be installed. But you could, for example, pay the building owner a lease over the roof and um, then the tenant can still have the benefit of the offset. Huh? So no reason why it shouldn't work, it's just a little bit more complex.